Wednesday, September 9th, and this is Senate Government Operations. Um, so we are looking at a bill that we have been calling Lessons Learned. And I think what's really important to remind people that we are not making any permanent changes to the statutes. What we're doing is putting in place some provisions so that if we find ourselves in a, the kind of emergency or as Tucker has put out different types of emergencies, we can have ready responses. As Senator Clarkson said yesterday, it is meant to keep us functioning in a more efficient way so that we don't have to, if we come back in January or, and find out that we are once again in the middle of some kind of emergency or next May or next June, that we have some provisions in place that can be put into effect. And so um, we are not making any permanent changes to the permanent statutes. When there isn't an emergency, the, we revert back to the permanent statute. So what I'd like to do, I think, is um, we have some issues around the open meeting uh, provisions, which I understand. But what I would like to do first is um, go to, um, I see that David Hurley, he is here with us. And just make sure that, because one of the provisions in there was around the um, executive director being able to act um, in consultation with the uh, commissioner of health for the board if, if the board was unable to meet. And I'd just like to, did that, did I say that right, Betsy? Okay. I'd just like to make sure that David is okay with that and that everything is okay so that he doesn't have to stay with us if he doesn't want to for this entire meeting and then get to him for his little tiny section at the end. So David. No, that, that was, um, that's fine. It's, it's actually, it's, um, it's, and with the authorization of the health commissioner, um, the um, I think the consultation is yeah. is with regard to OPR, but um, yeah, we're good with that. Okay, so we can cross that section off. We're fine with that. Good. Okay, thank you for joining us, David, and you certainly are welcome to stay. But I suspect you have other things that you need to attend to, so feel free. That may be David. That may be David's briefest testimony ever. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> If yeah, needed, I think it was um, anybody's just, just let me know. <laughs> I'll keep you guys in the background and and uh, just let me know if you need anything. Thank you, thank you, David. And then I think that the other one that we've pretty much settled on is the OPR issues. So I'd like to go there next, if that's okay with everybody, so that we can um, kind of also let Lauren leave if she wants to, or she can stay. I think she's rep also representing Chris Winters today. So, but let's go to the other OPR um, section so that we can make sure we're okay with those. Lauren. Good afternoon. For the record, Lauren Hibbert, Director of the Office of Professional Regulation. Um, is my internet being wonky? No, you're okay. fine. Um, I in no way can represent Chris Winters and his excellent hair. Um, so um, I can't I can't do that, but um, he did ask me to step in for him. Um, the elections changes he felt uh, were good and he supports. The public records changes I think he felt comfortable with, but he thought that there would be further lessons learned um, that may need to be explored in January. Yeah. Okay, but can you can you address the OPR issues first? So that we can- Oh, sure. Yes, sorry, I apologize. The OPR issues, um, I believe that the draft as written uh, works for OPR. Um, I've just been reviewing it and I don't see any problems. I don't know if there's any specific questions that this committee has for me, but um, it, it, looks, it looks good. It looks like it has everything that we were talking about um, earlier. Good. No, thanks. Our, I don't think we had any questions necessarily on, but we just wanted to make sure that it was okay because our intent, hopefully, is to pass it out tomorrow. Yes. This looks so good. we wanted to make sure that you were okay with, with what um, was there so we didn't have to review it again. It does look good. Um, okay. And I actually just, um, yes, it looks good. I was about to move on to elections again. No, not yet. 
the OPR sections look great. Thank you very much. Good. Thank you. And we have the um, inspection sections around um, uh, tax, can't remember what they're even called, but around the in-person um, uh, inspections for tax abatements. Are, right, is, for the CA to go yeah. and look at properties. So um, who, Gwen and Karen, are you guys okay with that? Uh, yeah, this is Karen. Yeah, I think we're good with that. Oh, okay, so we can cro we can check that one off as okay. Okay. Yeah. So then um, we have the uh, municipal elections issue, and um, I think we have a new version of that. I believe. Um, do we have it? Um, with do we have it? Can we put it up on the? Can you share it with us, Betsy Ann? I'll tell you. I'm beginning to think that um, that one of the things that happens with Zoom meetings is that there's some kind of a the screen has some kind of a sucking capability, and it's been <laughs> sucking my brain power right. <laughs> And I don't, I don't know where it's going, but there isn't much left. It's the inertia. I mean, it's, it's intellectually so stimulating, but it is so inert. We are so confined. And I think our conversation is somewhat constrained. And my brain is too. Yeah. And our brains. Well, I think that all goes part and parcel. So do we have it here? Is it on our website? And I think it's going to be right there. Okay. Oh, oh well, okay. Yes. So the elections. Um, and what draft is this that we're looking at? 3.1 still? I don't know. It's on the screen. Well, I know, but I can't see the screen. I'm going to our website to see if it's there. Okay. So, um, are there, does some, uh, Karen, Gwen, do you want to weigh in on this? Um, I'm, I'm not sure what, am I looking at um, Betsy Ann's most recent draft? I'm not sure what I'm supposed to be looking at, sorry. Is it 1.2? Is it, yeah. is it draft? I have, I have draft 1.2 at 1158 this morning. Okay. Right. All right. All right. That's what I have anyway. Yeah. Yep. And section so, seven. Section seven. I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay. These, these days just get away from you. <laughs> I was trying to talk. I couldn't get unmuted. Oh my gosh. Okay. That felt really, I felt I was struggling there. Okay. I'm here. I'm sorry, Karen. I didn't mean to run, interrupt you, but I was like, my mouth was shut. No, that's fine. <laughs> Um, so yes, th this would provide that during a declared emergency, which I think, a as you mentioned, Madam Chair, is important for all of these provisions. It's only during a declared state of emergency that's been declared by the governor. Um, the municipality may move the time and date of the annual meeting or special meeting. Right. And the town may, um, the town being the local legislative body to be specific, may um, decide to apply the provisions of the Australian ballot system. So I, I think that both those sections work, section seven and section eight. Okay, does anybody else wanna weigh in on that? Um, I, I don't think that that was, um, addressed at all in the letter from Lisa Loomis. She was mostly talking about open meetings. I don't think she addressed that issue, but does anybody else want to weigh in on that at all? Lauren, did you have some comments? Yes, I just wanted to say that I did hear from Will Senning, the elections director, and he agrees with how this bill is written um, on the elections section. Okay. All right, committee. 
any concerns, comments? The experts are in agreement. Okay, Anthony? I'm good. All set. Brian? Brian, did you say you're good? Yes, all set, sorry. Okay. And I don't see, is Chris with us yet? No. Okay, I didn't see. No, it. I said, actually, I was, we, we stuck with the 60 days in advance. So it's, you, know, you have to have an emergency that went on for a while before you even got to this kind of um, situation. So, uh, so Madam Chair? Yeah, it's, it's saying that during the state of emergency, uh, the legislative body can vote during that emergency to apply the Australian ballot system to an upcoming annual or special meeting, not less than 60 days in advance of that meeting. So I, I think that the timing in which that they could vote to apply Australian ballot is happening during the state of emergency. And it would be for a future meeting that is not less than 60 days in advance um, from when they make that determination um, to allow them to meet all of the deadlines that they'd have to meet to ensure that the meeting can be held by Australian ballot. So obviously, you already just said this, I'm just going to say it again, but if there's a meeting that's scheduled a month, a month out and there's an ice storm happens or some, some catastrophe happens, but the meeting's only a month away, we cannot change it for that meeting, which is only a month away. We only change it for meetings that are 60 days out. They can that change is correct. But then they would also be able to use if something like that were to happen and there seems like there will be an issue with that meeting that's now 30 days away they also have that extra section seven authority that lets them right. move the date and time of a meeting so right. if they can't meet that okay, no, I, I yes yeah. yeah, so I, I i could see how these two sections would work in concert yeah no, that's good appreciate it yeah because you might need to um in an ice storm, you might not need to use the Australian ballot provision, right. but you might need to change the time to uh, later on when the ice storm was over. Yeah. Okay. I got it. Thanks. Okay. Um, Madam Chair, I yes, just want to let you. you know I'm I am here, um, but okay. sorry I was late. I ended up having to go to the Rules Committee to try oh. to get a bill bill released. Um, and did you get it released? Uh, no, actually, I didn't because the chair of the meeting left <laughs> so abruptly that um, I, the rest of the committee we we could we didn't get a vote. Oh, and okay. they didn't want to go ahead and vote. That's all. All right, so we can cross this section off because we're okay with it. Or both both of them, seven and eight. Yeah, I mean this the part dealing with the municipal elections. Okay, let's go to the section on um, highway funds. And it looks to me like a Tucker and Betsy have, Ann have been very busy here combining these into what looks like a real bill. No more X, Y, Z's. Yes, it's got numbers. So, sorry, Thanks. what's the one, Jeanette? I'll, I will let Betsy say the page. Section six. The repeal. Yes, right. on page nine. This is the Tucker section. Okay, Tucker, you want to weigh in and just uh, remind us what it is so everybody can agree? Sure, 19 VSA section 312 uh, established a requirement that municipalities segregate their town highway funds from their general fund. Uh, this was tied to a time when municipalities were compelled to uh, collect a highway specific tax, a town highway tax, and appropriate those tax proceeds to a fund specifically for town highways. Um, I did pass this repeal uh, by the uh, transportation expert in our office who commented that the repeal would not have an impact on uh, state funds that are granted and held by municipalities for highway projects, uh, that this repeal would not have any impact on the management of those funds. Um, she did note that there are still some requirements on minim minimum allocations uh, for town highways in the budget. And, uh, you know, there are still going to be some constraints around how the town goes about approving its budget 
So for example, if the voters in a given municipality do determine to allocate a specific minimum amount to the town highway, uh, there could be some legal question as to whether those minimum funds could be mingled with the general fund in the case of an emergency. Um, but other than that very specific concern, um, this is good to go. And if you remember when we did this in the um, COVID issues, the transportation committee was okay with it. Yeah. And I, I want to, I apologize. I want to just make, go back one second to the municipal elections issues. I, Betsy Ann sent it to um, Philip, to Senator Baruth to, to have them look at it. And the House Education Committee has apparently sent over some issues around for uh, school boards around Australian ballot, but it's very complicated and it has a lot more in it. And he was going to just make sure that it um, jived with what we were doing here. And he'll let us know this afternoon. Okay, so we're basically okay with that. Um, I think what, remind me if we have stuff left other than um, open meetings. Uh, um, you still have water and wastewater disconnects. Oh yeah. yeah, where were we with that? And where? And where is it in uh, this new bill? Betsy okay. is about to bring it up. Um, page seven, section four. Oh, page seven, way back. So this version of the section uh, has one, a new look, and two, uh, some additions that you requested yesterday. First, as you may recall, the version that you looked at uh, over the last week had separate subsections dealing with each of the entities that provides uh, drinking water or wastewater services to ratepayers. Uh, I found a way to combine all of these entities into one subsection to make some of the subsequent drafting you asked me to do a bit more easier and fluid and hopefully easier, easier to interpret and read for those who are going to be applying this in the future. So subsection A now uh, goes step-by-step step with each of the entities. So it sets aside uh, not only this chapter, but any provision of law to the contrary, and then says that a municipality, uh, any of those entities that are permitted under 10 VSA chapter 56, and any of the PUC regulated entities and if you uh, go down, that gets us to line 16, which sets up our uh, state of emergency clause that we use throughout the bill, that any of those entities during a declared state of emergency are prohibited from disconnecting any person from those services. And then we hit the trigger that you asked for yesterday. Provided that first, the state of emergency is declared in response to an all hazard and recall that's the term that we've been discussing that comes from 20 VSA uh, chapter one uh, that will cause financial hardship and the inability of ratepayers to pay for water or sewer services. So there's the first trigger that you asked for. This has to be a disaster that causes financial hardship and the inability to pay. Moving on to subdivision two, and these are conjunctive, so they both have to happen. The second is that the all hazard does not require the municipality to disconnect water or sewer services to protect the health and safety of the public. So when you first looked at this, this was a blanket prohibition that would get triggered. These utility providers would not be able to turn off water or wastewater at any time during a declared state of emergency. And Senator Bray brought up a very good point, which is, well, what if the state of emergency is because of contaminated drinking water? shouldn't they be able to turn off the, the potable water system? And the answer was, of course, yes. So that's what this subdivision does. Uh, it ensures that if the all hazard requires that the water or wastewater gets shut off, that the utility provider can do so. Um, subdivisions B1 and 2 
uh, deal with the enforcement provision. Again, because we combined all of those previous subsections into subsection A, uh, we had to get creative with some of the enforcement provisions to make sure that the language was still there, um, but that it applies to this new structure we're using. Um, we can move on. Subsection C is the last new piece that you asked for. This is the piece that states that uh, during the state of emergency, while the disconnections are prohibited, that the ratepayer is still going to remain obligated for the bills that are accruing during the moratorium. So subsection C states that a ratepayer shall remain obligated for any amounts due to a water or sewer service provider that is subject to this section. The ratepayer shall have a minimum of 90 days after the end of the declared state of emergency to pay the amounts due. So this is setting up a minimum 90 day buffer for the ratepayer. Once the declared state of emergency ends, they have to have at least 90 days to uh, get the money to repay the amount due. Chris? Yes? You were the kind of the impetus for this. Does this sound okay to you? Oh, uh, yes, thank you. Uh, no, I think okay, was that a short yes, thank you? No, he, he's, he's in. I he's said, I said, yes, thank you. Mm -hmm. Right That's on the money. I meant, were right. you going to add more? Am I going to add more than yes, thank you? No, just. Okay. Sound, it sounds, uh, as I say, sounds, sounds just like what we need. So thank you. Karen? Uh, that that sounds good to us yeah, as well. Anyone else? Okay. Okay, we're done with that one. There was one other section. Other, I, I mean, I'm trying to make sure I get all the sections here. So remind me when I, if I skip over them. One was the municipal, the deadlines for permits and licenses from the. Uh, state to the municipalities and from the municipality to the individuals right so would you like to um i think tucker i think that was you yes so that's in section five and betsy is that on page eight yes at the bottom uh, of page eight starting on line 18 and to bring you back to yesterday, this is being added to 20 VSA chapter one, which is the chapter that contains all of the emergency declaration provisions and the uh, powers, procedures and operations during a declared state of emergency. So it would add a new section 47 there. It seemed like the right place to put this specific municipal authority that is only triggered by the uh, state of emergency. And I will put one note in here, which is important. Madam Chair, you said that this section uh, deals with both the state licenses, permits, and deadlines that are applied to municipalities and the municipal deadline uh, licenses and permits. In fact, this only deals with the municipal permits and licenses. Yeah. So, uh, the trigger here again is during the declared state of emergency, a municipal corporation may, important word, this is optional, extend any statutory deadline applicable to municipal corporations, provided that the deadline doesn't relate to a state or federal license permit or program. Two, extend or waive deadlines applicable to any licenses, programs, plans, permits that are issued by a municipality. Um, there is a default extension here that during a declared state of emergency, any expiring license permit program or plan that is issued by a municipal corporation that is due for renewal uh, shall remain valid for 90 days after the date that the declared state of emergency ends. So uh, this subsection, if it's triggered by the declared state of emergency, will automatically extend any of those licenses, permits, programs, or plans for 90 days after the declared emergency is ended. 
Okay. So I, I guess originally, or is everybody okay with this section? Yes. Yep. Karen? Yes. So I think originally we did have a section in there about the um, state uh, issued permits, but I guess um, from Suzanne, Secretary Young's uh, testimony yesterday, they don't want anything in there dealing with the state. So uh, I, my feeling is that I don't want, I, I think that it should be in here, but um, I guess we can have that conversation in January. I don't want anything to tank this. Betsy Ann. Hi, thanks. Uh, on that topic, I didn't know what the committee's, uh, I wasn't sure what the committee's final decision was on that issue. So I will just note that the draft currently contains, starting on page 11, um, that's section nine, uh, specific authority of the governor to extend professional licenses under the office of governor. I left it in, but if you'd rather remove it, I can take that out. Um, this is in regard to the professional regulation section. Um, relatedly, on page 12 and section 10, I granted that or this, <laughs> this draft would grant that same authority to OPR to extend professional licenses for the licenses that OPR issues. Um, so if you don't want to include those two sections, I could remove them. I wasn't sure what the committee's final decision was on that issue. Oh, I think we want to leave in the OPR part. Okay. To grant the licenses. I, I don't, you know, I don't think that, um, the governor has any ability to grant licenses under OPR. And I looked at the constitution. No other day, I mean yesterday. Actually, I look at it a lot. And um, it, it's right here. And it does say uh, that the governor can, uh, where is that? Chapter two, section 20. Yes. The governor can um, do, to can't, and, uh, May appoint officers um, and shall supply, let's see. May grant such licenses as shall be directed by law. Yeah, I, I was, I had it here, but it's in a different, I underlined it in a different version of the constitution. I have, unfortunately I have them laying all over at every place I sit. <laughs> so, but yes, it says, um, so I don't think the governor has any ability to grant licenses under OPR. And so I think we need to keep that provision in there. Okay. Does anybody else disagree with that? Keeping the o OPR provision? Absolutely yeah. not. Keeping I, the I, OPR provision in there. Absolutely. Okay. Chris? Oh, Lauren? I would ask that it remain as well. Um, I don't see how the authority is there without it. And, um, you know, Act 100 expressly included um, the extension of plumbers and electricians licenses. And those, um, I think in the conversation around Act 100, it was decided that we needed that language, that plumbers and electricians needed that language. And they are under the executive branch. And OPR, as um, my uh, boss is, uh, likely to say is he's a separately elected constitutional officer. Um, and the fact that OPR is under the Secretary of State, I think creates those constitutional issues that you're referring to, Madam Chair. So I would ask that this be included in this bill. Thank you. Um, Anthony? Yes. Brian? I guess I'm okay with that. I, I think again, regardless of what position or yeah, I guess what decision you make regarding, you know, the supremacy of the executive branch. At some point, OPR probably needs to still have it, even if I'm, I'm not. Say, I know what I want to say, but I, I'm having trouble forming the forming the words. Let me try it another way. If the emergency is such that the governor is preoccupied with much more serious events 
I think it is a wise decision to allow OPR to still function this way and, and not have the governor have to worry about it, so to speak. Does that make sense? It makes sense to me. And I think that um, okay. I would actually like to leave in the section about the, um, the administration, the, like the plumbers and electricians, since they were the ones that came to us it was the administration that came to us and asked us to put that in there when if they felt they could have done it by an executive order they could have just done it they didn't have to come to right. us but i i i don't want to take the chance that anything in here will tank this bill so i'm i'm willing to take that out and deal with that at another time right and i you know what i think this bill is going to inspire other committees um to get you know, to begin thinking in these directions. And I think this bill and a subsequent bill that we would hopefully the government operations committees would would do for everybody um, will in January just be a much more, you know, be even bigger because um, anyway, I'm, I'm thrilled we're leading the way on this. Okay, so let's take out this, that section. Section nine. We'll okay, I will remove that one. Okay. And that's the one that Suzanne testified about. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's not at this point not worth it. There are okay, other things so, we're going to be battling about. So, um, are there other sections in here that I've missed now, other than open meeting? Betsy Ann and Tucker. Yeah, I'll just go scroll through from where we were. Um, so the you'll see the OPRs emergency provisions. There are several. And then it goes to the Board of Medical Practices right. uh, emergency provisions, of which there are several, and those two are mere, essentially near mirror images of each other. And we've already said. I, I understood, yes, that the, uh, the two entities gave the okay to those, but they can always chime in if you want to further discuss. The last provision in this bill is in regard to the emergency sheriff funding. And I think you did already, Madam Chair, discuss that yesterday with yep. uh, Judge Anderson. And the language remains unchanged. So I'll just scroll through to the front of the bill. Um, what remains is the open meeting law provisions. We got the quasi municipal quasi judicial proceedings. And I think maybe you had already mentioned those we already discussed the moratorium on water disconnection and the municipal deadlines. So it looks like you are good to go for the uh, beginning with the open meeting law uh, provisions. Betsy, can I ask, um, and I'm sure we've gone over it, but I just don't know what section it's in. The ability of a municipality to extend uh, de deadlines for payment of taxes. I'm going to leave that to Tucker because that would be a section that he handled. But I, I know we talked about it. Uh, we talked about it, but I, I actually don't think we. Oh, I think it's in here somewhere. So well, it okay. is not in the bill. It's not specifically it's, in there. No, it's okay. not because we talked about it. But it's implied somehow. Tucker will tell us how it's implied. Uh, the ability of a municipality to uh, alter the time and method of a tax payment uh, to waive uh, interest and penalties on late yeah. payment, things like that exists in statute currently. Uh, the reason those came up during COVID was because many municipalities, any municipality could not meet during that wow. time to allow the voters to approve that action. Okay. So with uh, Betsy Ann's wonderful uh, elections and Australian ballot provisions, specifically around local elections, the municipalities and their voters will now have the ability to hold those votes and use uh, the current statutory system to change those deadlines. There doesn't need to be an emergency provision triggered there. Thank you. We lose our chair. Uh, 
I think we did. Yes, she's she's gone. She's gone. Where'd she go? I don't know. She disapparated. Went to Kansas. Or so, to Minnesota. You're up, I think, Anthony. I guess I just hope she's okay. Gail, uh, would you be kind enough to reach out to her? I sure will. I know she was having connection issues earlier, so maybe it's just that. Uh, uh, Com Comcast statewide is having issues. Yeah, as always. Anyway, the next step we, we were going to talk about had to do with the open meeting loss, right, Betsy? Betsy? <laughs> it's a it's a blocker. It's the Comcast blocker. I'm here. I'm here. Yes, that uh, open meeting law is your, I think, the last topic for you to review. So why don't we do that and hopefully we'll find Jeanette somewhere along the line. <laughs> Mr. Vice Chair. Yes, Chris. Uh, I don't see any uh, members of the press in the room at the moment. I don't know if um, they're they, I my understanding is, to join us or not. Well, Gail can correct me if I'm wrong, but they were invited, correct, Gail? They were invited, and if you look on our web page, there is a letter from Lisa Loomis that you may want to take a glance at. Well, if, if I could just mention, you have Ross Connolly on. Right. I don't see Lisa Loomis right now, but Ross Connolly's here. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I, I did not see, did, I missed the name. Thanks. Ross is a former, former editor, right, and publisher. Correct. Right. So I don't know whether we should go through the, what's in the bill first and then talk with Ross and others about how they feel about it. That would seem to make the most sense to me. Sounds good. Hey, uh, would you like me to do a brief walkthrough of the language? We would. Yeah, that would be okay. great. So section one of the bill adds a new section to the open meeting law. One VSA section 312A will be added to deal with the meetings of public bodies during a declared state of emergency. We'll start in subsection A with some definitions that are added here. Uh, and this ultimately constrains the application of the section. So first we define in subdivision A1 an affected public body. This is going to be the type of public body that is capable of exercising these provisions during a declared state of emergency. Uh, you asked for two triggers to be added here. The first is that the public body is one whose regular meeting location is located in an area affected by a hazard. We define hazard next, we'll leave that as it is for now. Second, that the public body cannot meet in a designated physical meeting location due to a declared state of emergency pursuant to 20 VSA chapter one. So recall part of the issue that came up that cued your work in open meetings is that meetings of this nature and size were prohibited during the declared state of emergency. So the hazard that may come up is in all hazards as that term is defined in 20 VSA section two subdivision one. The committee had looked uh, at that list in the all hazards definition and ultimately determined that rather than constraining the type of hazard that would trigger this, that it was more important to hone in on one, the public body's meeting location being in the area of the hazard or emergency and being affected by it, which is the trigger, and two, that they cannot designate a physical meeting location because of the declared state of emergency. Subsection B, it contains the uh, temporary open meeting provisions that you enacted during COVID. It adds them here so that during the next state of emergency, these will be automatically triggered. The first in subdivision B1 states that a quorum or more of the affected public body may attend a regular special or emergency meeting by electronic or other means without designating a physical meeting location where the public may attend. As you recall from your work on this in the spring, 
the deviation here is not in allowing an electronic meeting to take place. That is already permitted in the underlying open meeting law. The deviation is in not requiring a designated physical meeting location. Right. The open meeting law allows for electronic meetings provided that the public body designates a physical location that is accessible under the state's uh, public accessibility statutes and that a member of the public body or a staff member be at that physical meeting location. There are other requirements in section 312 around electronic meetings, uh, including that the technology that's used has to permit the public to hear the meeting that is taking place and allow the members of the public body to identify themselves. And second, that the members of the public body can hear and be heard. So essentially, I'm sorry, Tucker, but basically you have the meeting electronically, but one member of the board or whatever it would be, the legislative body would have to be in a room with a speakerphone, for example. So the members of the public could go to that room and listen in on the speakerphone. And be able to participate in the meeting. Right, yeah, okay. So what this did is it said, uh, ultimately, you do not need to have that physical meeting location during the state of emergency. You do not need to designate it. Uh, all of the other requirements around electronic meetings stayed in place and under this language will continue to stay in place. And I'll put a pin in that because we'll come to some things that you added as requirements that are not required normally under the open meeting law. Subdivision two, we just discussed, the members and staff of an affected public body shall not be required to be physically present at the designated meeting location. Subdivision three, uh, this dealt with the posting provisions that you put up and it deals specifically with municipal public bodies. It states that an affected public body of a municipality may post any meeting agenda or notice of a special meeting in two designated electronic locations in lieu of two physical locations or in any confirmation thereof. Um, the cause of the, this was a separate open meeting bill that you passed during COVID. And the trigger for this was that uh, under the open meeting law, the municipality is required to post in two designated physical locations in the municipality and at the clerk's office. And the problem that many municipalities uh, ran into there is that their designated physical locations, as would be expected, were in places where a lot of people are congregating and seeing the notice, right? So that would require the municipal official to go to a place of public congregation to post these, and there was concern around that. Or others, I thought there were other examples where people would post something, let's say, at a town clerk's office, but the town clerk's office was closed. Right. So nobody would see the posting because nobody went there at all. So either, either had large congregating people or nobody at all. Right. I mean, one of our locations is the library. The library's been closed. Right. right. I, thanks, Anthony. Oh, good. She's back. I have no idea what happened. I got kicked out. It. I think it's Comcast because yes, yesterday Sears and Brian both got kicked out of this floor session. Yeah, I did too, actually. Did you? Yeah. And Sorotkin and Hooker. There were a lot of people that were kicked out. Okay, well, I just got, and I kept trying to read in, and it said I didn't have any internet. But I guess it's back. So, so anyway, keep yeah. on, because I don't know where you are. Well, Tucker's going through the open meeting law, open okay. meeting pieces. Subdivision four has its own uh, additional trigger before this can be uh, used by an affected public body. Uh, this subdivision is triggered by a staffing shortage. So in the event of a staffing shortage during a declared state of emergency, uh, the affected public body may extend the deadline for the posting of minutes to not more than 10 days from the date of the meeting. Under current law, that requirement is five days. Moving on. 
So these are some of the uh, additional elements that you put in when you were authorizing these uh, electronic meetings without designated physical meeting locations during COVID. Uh, so the first, and let me do some work on my screen here. The first piece that you put in required that the affected public body use technology that permits the attendance of the public through electronic or other means. Second, that whenever feasible, the technology allows the public to access the meeting by telephone. And third, that uh, information on how the public may access meetings electronically be posted and that that information be included in the published agenda for each meeting. Subsection D requires the legislative body of each municipality and each school board to record any meetings that are held pursuant to this section unless unusual circumstances make it impossible for them to record those meetings. Finally, in subsection E, an affected public body of a municipality shall continue to post notices and agendas in or near the clerk's office. This is something that is already required in the underlying law, but you added something to it. You added that they shall provide a copy of each notice or agenda to the newspapers of general circulation for the municipality. So the way that this uh, section is laid out, just to give you the overview again, you provide uh, some authority for an affected public body to hold electronic meetings without a designated physical meeting location. And by posting electronic notices in lieu of notices posted in physical locations, and you require some additional guardrails around the conduct of those meetings which would include uh, using technology that permits the attendance of the public through those electronic means, which is also required under the general open meeting law to allow the public to access the meeting by telephone. That's an addition that you've put in uh, to post information about how to access the meetings, to record each meeting at the municipal and school board level unless there are unusual circumstances that make that impossible to do. And uh, finally, to post notices, not only at the municipal clerk's office, but also to provide a copy of each notice or agenda to the newspapers of general circulation. Um, one of the things that did come up during the discussion of the temporary uh, COVID provisions that we could do here to further constrain and uh, guard this is if we go back to subsection A, uh, here we have not withstood generally, um, my apologies, we're actually gonna look at subsection B, Betsy. Uh, in subsection B, uh, we have not withstood generally section 312. And there was some concern at the time that we used this language during the, uh, in the COVID provisions that this would trigger from some of the uh, public bodies, the impulse to ignore section 312 in its entirety, rather than just conflicting provisions. So, uh, and what we did was we called out specific subsections and subdivisions that were being not withstood as a way to point those public bodies to, we are not setting aside the entire open meeting law, we are just setting aside these discrete provisions. Um, we can do that again here. We cannot withstand a chain of those specific subsections and subdivisions in section 312 to make sure that we are pointing out specifically these are the areas that are changing when we have a declared state of emergency. So if we did, Tucker, if we did that, that wouldn't change things on a practical level. It would just make things more clear. Right. So I had a question. When we were talking about what normally happens, 
Tucker mentioned that as long as there was a speakerphone and one of the members or a staff person from that local legislative body in attendance, the public could come in and actually participate by speaking. I don't see any of that sort of language in the ones that we adopted temporarily. Or by presumption, if you are attending by telephone, is that all assumed that you can, can you speak or can you just hear it? I, I thought Tucker was clarified that they had to be heard and to hear. They have to be able to participate, I think. Yeah. They so th that requirement in the open meeting law that is that the members of the public body can hear and be heard. Um, oh. Let me see if maybe we can pull up. Am I authorized to screen share here? Maybe I can share some of the um, open meeting provisions. I am not, I am disabled from sharing. Uh, you, Gail could maybe make you able to be sh to share. Okay, you should co-host. Uh, I has anyone attended a select board meeting during COVID? Because I have, and, and I was able to raise my hand and speak. I mean, it was very easy. I mean, it was there weren't more than fifty people attending, so it, it I guess made it a little easier. But uh, it, it was very easy to participate. Yeah, same here for me. So if we go to the open meeting law, 1 VSA section 312 in subdivision A2, we have the rules surrounding participation in meetings through electronic or other means. So uh, similar to the language we're using here, this allows uh, the public body to hold their meeting through electronic means um, without being physically pre present at a designated meeting location. Uh, however, if one or more members attend a meeting by electronic or other means, uh, the members may fully participate in discussing the business of the public body and vote, but any vote of the public body that is not unanimous shall be taken by roll call. There's a requirement that uh, still exists that we have not, not withstood. Um, it requires that each member who attends identify himself or herself when the meeting is convened, and this is the piece that we were just talking about here in subdivision A to C Romanet 2, that they be able to hear the conduct of the meeting and be heard throughout the meeting. Right. This applies to the members of the public body. Um, in subdivision D here, this is where the rub was when we were dealing with uh, trying to allow the public bodies to meet during the stay at home order. If a quorum or more of the members attend a meeting without being physically present, um, actually this is not the piece, yeah, uh, they shall designate at least one physical meeting location where a member of the public can attend and participate in the meeting. So that's the requirement there. When we were dealing with the underlying law, you had to designate a physical meeting location and that member of the public had to be able to attend the meeting. So I'm assuming hear the meeting, potentially see the meeting and be able to participate. At least one member of the public body or at least one staff member had to be physically present at that physical meeting location. So my question was when we adopted the temporary provisions, it seems like we left this part out about a member of the public being able to participate. Mm -hmm. Let, let's go to uh, I didn't no, think we, so. didn't, we didn't put it in the provisions, which means that it's still in the open meeting law, the underlying open meeting law, right? Okay. Yeah, yeah they that I thought that's what drove a bunch of our the measures that we adopted was to enable what's already in the open meeting law. The temporary provisions very specifically call out, and if you go to the language that you're using now, 
in subsection C in subdivision one, and this is what Senator Collimore is potentially flagging here, a used technology that permits the attendance of the public through electronic or other means. Right. I can't say that I recall any of the specific testimony about why um, we left out the ability to attend, didn't call it out, but the reason that the telephonic access got put in there, the reason that you made some of the choices that you made around electronic access was that not every municipality had the same level of technological capability to ensure both attendance and participation or you know, there was even some uh, discussion around whether every municipality would be capable of ensuring access by telephone, which is why that whenever feasible clause got put in there. Um, but at this point, having gone through the experience, you may have some insight on whether you do want to require municipalities to permit uh, participation. Yeah, and that was my question, Tucker, was the phrase attendance presuming participation. And I say it doesn't. You can be in attendance at something and still not be allowed to talk. Can, can I, Anthony, can I throw Sure, no, go ahead, go ahead, sure. I, um, the ability to participate uh, in a select board meeting or a public meeting is somewhat up to the chair of that meeting. I mean, the, the, there are select board meetings where um, people readily participate. When I was on the select board in Putney, when people would come, we would just kind of all sit around the table and just have this general discussion. They couldn't vote, but they were part of the discussion. There, when you go to a Brattleboro select board meeting, it's, it's big and they have a lot of people there and people can't just throw out comments and participate. They, there's a public comment period where they can participate but they do not participate in the general discussion because it's a meeting of the select board. It isn't, and, and there are times for them to participate, but you can't just raise your hand and say, hello, I have something to say. That isn't the way most when, select board meetings work. But when they ask for public, I mean, yes. when they open it up to ask for questions, yes. or, or if public, then, then it is essential that people be able to participate as well as attend right and, and i that thought is in, that is in the open meeting law so i don't know that didn't do anything to negate the open meeting law right i i thought that this was still the underlying um the default i thought so too because it was all our efforts with the telephones and with everything else was to ensure that the public could hear and be heard okay Thank you. Um, may I comment? This is Karen. Yeah, sure. Um, I, if you look at um, page two, section C, and then following um, item three on page three says you need to post information on how the public may access meetings electronically. So not only with respect to telephone, that's two, and then three is electronically. Um, and I, uh, you're you're correct, Madam Chair, that an awful lot of select boards they have a public comment period at the start of the meeting for um, twenty minutes or something, and right. that's posted on the agendas. Very well. Thank you. So do we need to add anything there or do we just this part of the open meeting law is the default, Tucker? So I will um, set up two pieces here and say that it's complicated. And if you want to go the prudent and safe route, you should, if this is the policy decision you're making, add the ability to participate into that C1. So first, the reason that I would say that's necessary is that C1 is more specific during this state of emergency than the underlying law that you are setting aside. It parrots the same language, but it intentionally leaves out the ability to participate. 
It is not there. So if you leave out that ability to participate, um, that subdivision could be interpreted to not require the public body to provide the opportunity to participate. It would only allow the ability to um, access the meeting, attend the meeting, so to speak. So if I can add a comment. Oh, I'm sorry, Tucker. Um, now, remember, we're already dealing with something more specific here, which is the uh, attendance through electronic means. Generally, we fall to this subsection H that requires, and I think that I've put it up here for you guys, that at an open meeting, the public shall be given a reasonable opportunity to express its opinion on matters considered by the public body. So there's the participation requirement, as long as order is maintained. So the public body can adopt some rules around how that comment period plays out practically, reasonable rules. And further that those, uh, yeah, the public comment will be subject to reasonable rules established by the chairperson of the public body. Um, that would be the general requirement when we're dealing with an open meeting. We then get more specific in the general electronic meeting provisions, but still in those general electronic meeting provisions, we call out participation in that subdivision A2. Where a member of the public can attend and participate. Um, if you want to ensure that the public, without a doubt, must be given the opportunity to participate in these meetings during the state of emergency, you should likely add and participate to that subdivision C1. So here's where I'd like to throw in a comment that we need to be, the select boards need to say, this is how you can participate. Just as right now, how you can participate in a select board meeting in a non-emergency is by going to the select board meeting. That's how you participate. So the select board or whoever need to say, this is how you can participate. But I don't think we have any ability to say to select boards that they have to guarantee that the person who lives on the dead end street at the end of four miles of town trail and has a phone has the ability to participate by picking up the phone and calling in. I, I think that there needs to be a provision for to uh, tell people how they participate. But right now, I mean, the comment that in the letter, for example, that said that people have to buy a new phone or a computer in order to participate, right now they have to buy a car. I mean, they have to get to a place. So I don't think this is any more onerous. And I would hate to see us say that every, every meeting has to allow anybody in any form to the ability to participate at all because I, I don't think that's reasonable right now. That's just a, a comment. I know that other people feel differently. I think that um, oh, Ross, for example, feels differently and I know that Lisa feels differently, that I think they feel that everybody should have the ability to participate regardless of where they live or how they connect to the meeting. So. Well, throw that, out. that isn't, you're, you're absolutely right. That isn't true now. I right. mean, there are many town halls that are not accessible for the disabled or, I mean, there are lots of, there, are, you cannot at the moment, at this very moment, guarantee that everyone can participate. But uh, I think if people want to, when it's a high priority, we can make it uh, as accessible as possible. And yeah. I, I think this, I think this is good. I would also say that we also cannot even imagine every hazard. So I was just thinking as we're talking about electronic that, you know, what if the hazard is the grid has gone down in North America? It's like, well, we're back to meeting in person in daylight and everyone, you know, if they're all in electronic cars, they're all walking. <laughs> it's like, you know, it's a, we, we cannot even begin to fathom some of the hazards we may be facing. Um, I, anyway, that was just an aside. So I think that we need to say that the, the 
agenda needs to be needs to tell people how they can have the ability to participate right but not necessarily guarantee that every single person who who um doesn't every single person has the ability to participate from wherever they are because they don't as Allison pointed out they don't have that ability now I mean they have to drive down to the town hall right they have to get out of their car so somebody um who doesn't have a car can't participate now so, or an old person who doesn't drive at night that's right right exactly so I I think that we need to allow for the them to say how you can participate and it's up to the individual to figure out how to access that participation. Well, could you refer to some kind of reasonable means of participation or something like that? Uh, so, I'm sure I see Tucker sitting there writing. I'm sure he's right. coming up with wonderful language and Gwen just had a suggestion. No, no I don't have a suggestion. I'll just say that uh, the um, legislative bodies have reasonable rules of regulation already in terms of public participation and they can be really um, broad or really narrow and some you know uh, you mentioned Brattleboro they have very specific regulations in terms of um, limiting not limiting participation but just keeping it in sort of um, a, a format where the order is maintained because it's a meeting of the public body that the public can attend, but it's really the selectors still has to do their work, right? Um, so a lot of the um, rules that you read through that are already in place cover a lot of those nuances where you say, you know, the first order of business or the last order of business, we're allocating this amount of time for public participation. Um, and I will say anecdotally, I'm the chair of my planning commission. We've been doing our meetings um, via zoom and we've had more public participation we had all of maybe one or two people in an entire year show up to our planning commission meetings for um changes to our uh, zoning bylaws um we've had public attend all of our meetings um virtually so it's actually increased public participation in a lot of um, municipalities right Thank you, Madam Chair. I, the only, I just want to make it clear, I wasn't necessarily advocating one way or the other. I just brought it up because I read the language a, a lot, and, and I thought that it was just slightly different in terms of what we adopted as temporary provisions. I didn't see that word participate, and so I was just bringing it up to, to note that um, it may have been something we wanted to consider. That's it. Yeah, no, no, I, I, I got that, but it's come from other sources too. That's why. So Anthony, where, where were you? Had you started taking any testimony from? Um, no, we, no, we had not taken anything. Well, Ross hasn't spoken, and we, I was going to suggest that we hear from both Ross and from DLC, from Karen. And Mike Donahue is with us now too. Oh yes, I didn't know that. So we should hear from those folks. Yes. Okay, so I would suggest that, um, oh, Chris, I think has a question or are you just waving your hand? No, I was just gonna say that, I, I'm sorry that I hadn't noticed that Ross came into the room and earlier on when we were talking about, is anyone from the press here? And um, also just wanted to um, congratulate Mr. Conley on his uh, uh, International Journalism Award, the Survey Award that he was oh. just, just received, so. Um, an old fan of the Hardwick Gazette, so sorry I didn't see you come in the room. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank Wait, you. What's the award? What was the award? The uh, Eugene Servi uh, Award from the International Society of Weekly Newspaper Editors, um, which was um, actually in 2018, I think, that uh, um, I received that award. Thank you very much. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. So who, who how do you want to do this now? Because uh, we have the letter from Lisa, who I realized couldn't be here. And there were some specific things. And I, when you um, speak to us, one of the things that I would like you to, she pointed out a number of things, like meetings are not being properly warned. Um, they're not putting their agendas up. Um, things like that. And I, when you talk to us, I would like you to address the issue of whether it's worse now than it was before this. 
um, in terms of, I mean, we always have rogue select boards out there who don't play by the rules. And is it worse now? Um, because, and remember, we're not making permanent changes to the open meeting law. This is still only in the case of an emergency. Right. So, right. so Ross and Mike, you can figure out how you're going to go here. Actually, before you do that, I just want to mention that that's one thing that's pretty clear. But in Lisa's letter, she starts off by saying that we shouldn't consider making permanent the temporary changes made to the open meetings law. When I read that, my first thought was that we're not really making these things permanent. We're making them relative to another another emergency. Mm -hmm. So I just want to be clear on that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, shall I go ahead, Madam Chair? Sure. Okay. Um, Thank you. Uh, my name is Ross Connolly. Um, I'm uh, kind of wearing two hats or removing two hats, if you will. Uh, last March, I was elected uh, to the uh, Board of Trustees of the Judevine Memorial Library here in Hardwick. So I'm a public official. Um, and uh, up until 2017, I was the uh, editor and uh, publisher of the Hardwick Gazette. My late wife and I bought the newspaper in 1986 and um, I sold it in 2017. Uh, so I, um, my thoughts are, are based on my experiences, but I'm not here speaking um, on behalf of the Hardwick Gazette nor the uh, Judevine uh, Library Board of Trustees. Um, and with regard to um, uh, the, the question of the access to public meetings, um, my concern um, is, um, how that access is given and specifically uh, with the agendas, um, is the agenda gonna be required to uh, list um, the means of electronic um, participation or access? Um, talking about Zoom, is it gonna have the Zoom link and is it gonna have the password? Because there have been um, boards that have listed both and so then it's just up to the member of the public to uh, download a, a Zoom uh, um, program and hit the link and put in the password and go to the meeting. Um, other uh, boards have said uh, that if you want to attend the meeting, you have to call the um, municipal office, the electric department, the library or whatever, and get the access information. And um, so I would like to see something that required uh, the body, uh, municipal board, uh, whatever it is, to um, that it shall provide that information. Um, and in, in the um, uh, discussion, um, the word information was used. I think it would be better to perhaps give um, with some specifics to regard what information means. Uh, does it mean the password, the link, um, the telephone number, whatever? And um, uh, when a meeting is a Zoom meeting, um, if the Zoom link or the Zoom password changes from week to week or month to month, whenever the meeting is, is meeting, that's essentially a new location. And so if the board um, needs to put the location of the meeting, then it needs to put the password because that's the actual location. Um, I, my understanding of Zoom is you can just have a permanent Zoom link and password. So at the beginning of the year, when you post the time and place the meetings will be held, um, you know, you're fine. But if you're uh, not using the same Zoom link for each meeting, you've changed the location and the public needs to be informed of what that location is. And so that's part of what information, um, the, the word information, I think, needs to have some specificity. Um, one of the other um, aspects, if I might jump on to some of the other sections within the uh, proposal. Um, uh, may, may I just ask a question, say something, uh, Madam Chair or uh, Mr. Vice Chair? Yes, from both of us. Yes, we agree. <laughs> uh, Ross, thank you uh, for that. 
I think uh, in Woodstock, we embed the Zoom link, but um, for our public meetings, but you know, there is a lot of concern every time practically people are concerned about being Zoom bombed. And so, you know, there has to be kind of a, it's a, you know, a funny thing when you publish the Zoom link, uh, it, you're also opening yourself to a hacker uh, and uh, and Zoom bombing. So it's, for me, that it's a it's a challenge. I mean, that's what we're doing now in Woodstock, but it, it does make us very vulnerable. Right. I That has occurred here in Hardwick. Not, I don't know about the Zoom bombing, but that concern has been raised. Um, but I, I think that... Uh, um, that's something that has to be dealt with by the board. Um, as Madam Chair said, um, it's up to the chairperson of the board to maintain the decorum of the, uh, uh, what happens at a meeting. And so if we're at a select board meeting or a library board meeting or, or something in person in the library or in the town offices um, and somebody walks in off the street to attend the meeting, which they have a right to do, but then gets out of hand, um, starts shouting, um, you know, won't wait until called on or wants to speak uh, um, beyond the public uh, um, time, the chair has the means to um, address that situation from calling the person out of order to um, having somebody from security come and remove the person. And so I think if um, there's a situation where um, a Zoom meeting is Zoom bombed, it's got to be held, dealt with at when that happens. I don't think it's right to go in uh, um, as a cautionary measure to avoid that happening, to deny the um, uh, access code to that meeting. I mean, the, you know, as a member of the public, if I'm going to go to a planning commission meeting, I don't have to call and find out, get right. to go to the meeting. I just go to the meeting. And so if what there, I there, say is not, there's a, there's a he has to leave. There's, there's a difference though, because uh, in the physical meeting, if somebody's out of order and it gets really unpleasant and security has to come or whatever and remove that person, the meeting can continue. When you're Zoom bombed, the meeting has to end. And the only p way they can come back into the meeting is if they get reinvited. So you would immediately limit access to just the select board, the manager, and the clerk, uh, because that's all you'd know who were present. At, at, you know, so anyway, that's taking it a little too far, but th that is what happens when you're Zoom bombed. You can't, you Right, and is, is that a uh, uh, question of technology or is that a question of public access? And I think it's a technological question, a very legitimate question, and we should look to the technology to solve that uh, problem, potential problem. We shouldn't look to um, uh, closing right. access to the meeting. I, I will say that in the, um, it is probably a technology question, but with the technology that we have right now, we have to make, we have to set up our provisions acknowledging that technology and we, when we have our meetings, when we have our meetings in the state house, anybody could walk in if there's room in the room. If there isn't room in the room, then they can't come in. Yeah. But if there's room, somebody can walk in whenever they want to a committee meeting. When we're on technology, they we don't publish the um, the link. But if anybody, when people read the agenda items, if they ask to be invited, we invite them. But we, so we're, do, we're doing the same thing. And so we are limiting access in a way too, but we're having more people having access because they don't have to drive from Hardwick to Montpelier to walk into the room. So I think Chris had a question. I mean, or comment. Yeah, I mean, I know that the legislature's response so far has been to end the meeting as sort of an absolute secure way of ending the Zoom bombing. But um, I think there are other options and we should, as you're saying, it's a technology issue. I wouldn't want to lean too heavily on that. For instance, I think the person managing the meeting can um, 
uh, mute the person for sure. And I think they can actually even turn off their, their video feed. So, uh, you know, there may be ways to yeah. basically forcibly remove someone from the electronic meeting without blowing the whole thing up as in shutting it down and making people log all back in again and maybe losing people. So I think it'd be good to not count too hard on that interpretation of what how these meetings run. Right, 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 thank you. So Ross, I think you wanted to um, address some other issues. Is it other issues aside from the open meeting? No, I wanted just to make a couple other comments about the um, open meeting and, and mm -hmm. the uh, minutes, if I may. Uh, Go ahead. Um, um, provision in the uh, bill under consideration um, calls for the release of minutes up to 10 days, and it's currently five. And I, I just uh, wonder about why there would be a need to extend from five to 10 days. Um, 10, 20, 30 years ago, when we were taking uh, minutes uh, on a yellow pad with pen, um, that, that, and then the minutes had to be retyped, that uh, um, perhaps had some reasonableness. But um, I, I think it's pretty much of a reality that um, today, minutes are being taken on a laptop or an iPad um, or something. I know on our library board, our secretary, who's a board member, um, sits there and takes the minutes while we're meeting. And the meeting adjourns, and by the time um, we all get back home, we've been sent the meeting minutes. And um, it's, to me, um, the, the technology here offers us that opportunity. It's basically you take the minutes and you hit send and they're available on the town website or wherever. Um, the, uh, um, um, need for extra time, um, I, I just don't see it. And, and one other aspect about meeting minutes that um, have been um, raised over the years as well. There, there, there may be in, in, um, inaccuracies or uh, they may need to be corrected or whatever. Well, the fact is um, any minutes that are taken are draft minutes. Uh, they only become approved minutes at the next meeting. And uh, um, when the board um, has the opportunity to make additions and corrections to the meeting that occurred previously. And so um, the fact is we release minutes, um, draft minutes from a meeting. And so I, I think mm -hmm. that the, the time frame in which those draft uh, minutes are, are released um, should be as close to the meeting as possible rather than moving it farther away from the meeting. Uh, so um, that's just a concern I have about that. And the only other um, um, issue I had back on page one, um, where the it said the um, 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 board may uh, post um, the electronic um, meeting agenda and whatever. Um, I wonder if that shouldn't be shall post the meeting, uh, the electronic meeting and agenda, um, because again, um, how's the public going to know um, if there is an emergency, um, you can't go to the post office or the library or whatever uh, to see a paper agenda hanging there. Um, the only way to get it might be electronically. And, and so um, I think the, the firmness of shall um, would, would strengthen that. So thank you. Thank you. Any questions or comments, committee, or the, I think that we should jump to um, Mike, and then um, and I have to say that I have no problems with the with the five days or ten days. I don't feel strongly about that one way or the other. But did you know that there isn't even a requirement to have um, approved minutes? You just have to have. Yeah. Minutes. 
Yeah. And that sometimes happens when you have a, like a three member board, two people leave, they elect to a town meeting and they're not available to uh, approve the minutes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> a majority that were there at the last meeting or something. So uh, I'm glad to let the league go ahead of me. I'm, I've been a little late to the party here. So I guess I'd be interested in hearing what the league might have to say if they've got anything to add. Okay, thanks, Karen. Uh, thank you. Uh, so we um, are okay with the provisions that are in section one regarding open meeting law in emergency situations. Again, I have to emphasize these are only in declared emergency situations. Uh, I think it's reasonable to add in specifically that you need to say how uh, the public can participate in the meeting as part of your posted agenda. I do want to refer you to two articles recently about Zoom bombing. One was on August 5th in Brattleboro. They tried to mute and they tried to shut down the video of the person and um, it was kind of, a, uh, it was a mess and very yeah. unpleasant. And then August 9th, the um, Rutland Town Select Board was also Zoom bombed and they eventually did close down their meeting. Um, having said that, uh, Zoom is not the only electronic means that towns use. There are a lot of other platforms out there that different towns have elected to use uh, for their meetings during this period when you don't want to have people um, assembling in one place. And I hate to say this is just my prediction, but I think we're going to get back there before the winter is over. So um, I, I would be careful about um, changing those requirements regarding physical uh, locations too much. And with respect to minutes, I just have to say, so I'm vice chair of my planning commission. I take the minutes. Um, and during this emergency, it, it's been completely chaotic, not only because you're taking minutes for a, a municipal committee, but also in all the other aspects of your life. So we felt that it was very, um, that it was helpful and in fact, mildly considerate to allow um, for up to 10 days to post those minutes if need be. Uh, I, I'm not sure how everyone else feels, but it seems like every day there's a new crisis. So I'll just say that about the minutes. Thank you. Karen, would you um, comment on the last comment that Ross had was about um, the may to shall post the um, agenda electronically and Well, it does say that um, they may post it in lieu of posting it in physical locations. Um, and the underlying law is um, the two designated public places, physical places. So um, I think that what, what you're trying to do in the language of the bill is give towns the option um, of either physical locations or electronic notices. You can't just that, not post them. I think that was the the um, if they po if they continue to post them into, depending on the emergency, um, they may be able to post them in two places, and that would still be the best way. But they have the ability to to replace one of those. Right, an, an awful lot of towns already did, as a matter of course, post on their websites as well meeting notices. Okay. Tucker, was that right? Yes, that is correct. The, the word may was used to allow municipalities the option of posting electronically in lieu of the physical locations or in a combination of electronic and physical locations. There is still the underlying obligation to post in two locations. 
Right. And list is lit and list serves have been used a lot for this during the co course of the pandemic. And uh, Ross actually brought up something in his comments on the electronic posting made to shall recommendation. That's important to note. Uh, part of that was a concern about how does the public know that the municipality is going to be posting in a given electronic location. Uh, we discussed this during the temporary provisions. We specifically put the word designated in there. The municipality has to designate the electronic locations that they are going to use. So the public will know if they do in fact designate what those electronic locations are going to be. Which is what they do now with their designated, um, they have to say it's gonna be at the Putney General Store and the library or wherever, but yeah. Mike? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, just a couple of points. One thing about the public notice, the issue is, uh, and I think Secretary, uh, uh, Senator uh, Clarkson made reference about listservs and things like that. I'm not sure that listservs is a proper designation. Public notice is designed to be placing it where the public will notice it. And you have to sign up to be on a listserv in order to have a private group that may or may not have this, the uh, town clerk send you an agenda. That's a positive thing to get, get on those, but a lot of people don't have computers. A lot of people don't know they can sign up for, for those kinds of things. It's, they're designed to put the notice up in the supermarket, in the library, at the post office, in the town hall. So when people walk in to pay their taxes, get their dog license, they see that there are meetings being held and, and yeah. everything like that. So, But Mike, Mike, during yeah. a hazard, during a hazard, you know, pe people are barely going to town hall. So I would dare say during the pandemic, more people have accessed the listserv than they have town hall. I. I I, I do think that, Mike, I think you're right. I don't think that a listserv is an appropriate designated site, but yeah. it could be also on a listserv. But yeah. I don't, sure. I don't sure. think- Sure, the more people, that, the more way you spread these notices of meetings. Right. I mean, we favor that, whether, whether you have electronic, whether you have the hard right. post, the sending them to a newspaper and anything else you can shout from the highest mountain is that we're going to yeah, have a select board meeting this week. I didn't mean to imply Woodstock was using it as its formal notice. It's just been doing being used additional. It's been great. More people. Yeah. Have Tucker, could I ask you before we continue this? Would how is it worded there? I I don't think that a listserv would be considered an appropriate public electronic posting site. So in that subdivision three, and this is for everyone's edification on page two and line 11, the affected public body of a municipality may post any meeting agenda or notice of a special meeting in two designated electronic locations. Electronic location is not defined for this purpose. Uh, and again, at the time, uh, there were some objections around how the public would know where to go and the requirement that you put in there was the designation that it didn't necessarily matter what the electronic location was so long as the electronic location was designated and therefore the public is put on notice. We are putting our agendas here in this location. This is where you can find them. Um, I think it would be perhaps more difficult to find them in the list serve, but the language does not define or spell out what the electronic location must be, just that it should be designated. Could you, could you add the language publicly accessible so that it's clear that it has to be, it can't be my, my email? Yeah, I think that's important, Madam Chair. I, I, I think you know, it's one thing to go to a website, but it's another to try to get into a listserv, especially right. at night. Right, so if we put publicly accessible. 
Well, okay. but in all honesty, listserv is a totally public thing. I mean, yeah. anybody can sign up for it. Yes, but you have to sign up for it. I can't just go to your listserv right now. If I wanted to look at the Woodstock, I need to know where I can go to see the agenda. I don't think a listserv is an appropriate right. designation. Yeah. Okay. Mike, do you want to continue? I'm sorry. I. No, 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 no. Sorry. That was a rabbit time. hole I introduced. <laughs> I you have good rabbits. You have good rabbits down in Woodstock. I know. So, um, the password thing that Ross mentioned, and I think Lisa mentioned. I mean, obviously, you don't want to beat a dead horse, but I, I, we did get several letters from reporters, editors in Wyndham County, where there's been several problems lately, including a school superintendent who put up the wrong numbers or access codes, whatever. And it was a hot meeting about in-school learning. And uh, I think we've got to be careful. I think the, the codes ought to be up there. There is Zoom bombing. There is ways to shut it off. And uh, I think the league mentioned two cases over six months out of 250 towns. Um, there, were, there are ways to control that. And the legislature controls it. So I'm not sure that that's as much of a serious issue. One thing that we do hear a lot of complaints about is that some of the uh, municipalities set it up so that there is like one whatever camera, one camera angle, and apparently one microphone. And so when they're in a huge meeting hall, um, people aren't heard, they can't be seen, they have no idea who's speaking. There is no introduction of people. They're not required to say who they are. The chair doesn't introduce them. And people at home, and it's not just reporters, but people at home are complaining that they have no idea who's talking, who's proposing things, who's talking down something, opposing it, whatever. So there's gotta be a better way to address public access so that it Mike, is. Can I ask you a question about that? Sure. Yeah. If you're if you're in a public meeting and the public is there in the meeting, uh, is that what you're talking about? You already have you're already in a public setting with people in the room with you. Is that what you're talking about? Well, but there's a lot of meetings. Uh, I was on one the other night where the select board was what what is what was a bingo hall essentially. And they're sitting spread out in the audience. There was audience, but the meeting was also zoomed because they were afraid there wouldn't be enough seats and mm -hmm. space and social distancing. So they zoomed it. So mm -hmm. all these people are talking, and and there was one set ca camera or whatever angle showing the select board three of the five, I think, <laughs> and uh, you couldn't see anybody else. And there's all these people talking and there's essentially, I believe probably was one microphone. And a lot of times people wouldn't step up to the microphone. They'd talk from their seat. And so maybe the board's hearing them, but the general public, there, there was, you couldn't hear it. There was no transparency with no understanding of what was going on in the, in the meeting. So yeah. that, that is a problem. And I know, I think Lisa mentioned that in her letter of that being a problem in Washington County quite a bit at, at different boards and commissions that she brought up. Um, um, the 10 day uh, issue, I can't let it go by without making a comment. You know, that's near and dear since you've rejected that four or five times in the last six years, I think. Um, I guess I'm not so not sure. I, I understand Karen's busy lady, and she may be vice chairman of the of her planning commission. But uh, I do know there's an awful lot. Ross gave a perfect example of of a secretary cranking out minutes in one hour after a meeting. So uh, it's a issue of commitment, and that's always been. If you're committed to doing the minutes, and and I know somebody who's a school teacher who takes the school board minutes 
and she's got three kids and she's active in the community and she can she cranks those out it's a thursday meeting and they're out by saturday at the latest saturday morning so it's an issue of commitment 10 days is too long as i think lisa put in her note they're coming up on budget time i agree with her it some of the towns have budget meetings a couple times a week or once a week. So if you're going to wait 10 days, you're not going to know what's going to happen, especially in the light of what she said was defunding of police or other cuts that may be happening. So the public may not know for 10 days that the Woodstock uh, Select Board or Village Trustees decided to cut the uh, police budget in half or whatever. So I think it's really important, especially coming up in this time frame with the budgets and our economy the way it is, that people know what's going on in those budget sessions. Um, maybe uh, the other thing I skipped over when we were talking about Zoom bombing, perhaps the League of Cities and Towns can offer training to the towns of how to avoid Zoom bombing and how to overcome it. You know, that's that would be something that probably all the towns would be interested in being proactive and, and having some training, so. Uh, but the training might be Zoom bombed. And well, then, then they could do it firsthand. They could see it firsthand and see how they react. <laughs> well, and see if anyone effectively can mute or uh, <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> so, uh, I will, uh, I know uh, Lisa Loomis was hoping to get on today I know she's on deadline, uh, but her letter, I, I think, speaks for itself. I mean, there's, I'll try to answer any of the questions if you had any about any of her points. I mean, I know some of them we did uh, um, send a note out to some people. And, and again, it seemed like there was a major problem in Wyndham County, Washington County had some issues. Well, I think Wyndham County had, a problem with one superintendent. I mean, that was the problem, right? And, uh, and so that, that, that was that came from one person. But let me let me see if I can. But there was the issue of being able to hear people is uh, something that was was sent to me by one of the reporters down there. I I I think that um, some of these are 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 issues that need to be worked out. I'm not sure how we address that in a bill that we say that it, it is essential that every time you have a meeting, you have enough microphones. Um, I mean, if you go to town meeting, sometimes the little kids that run around with the microphone don't always get to the person that's speaking until they're done speaking and they shouldn't do that. But I, I don't know how we address that here and say that every single meeting has to have enough microphones and enough cameras so that everybody who speaks can be heard and seen. And so my, my question here is a lot of these are technology issues that have to be worked out. I understand that. But other than um, the three um, suggestions that I've heard here, changing the minutes from 10 to five, and putting publicly accessible um, electronic sites and um, putting the, the access information into the agenda itself. I don't have, I haven't heard any specific language to change this. And remember again, this is not permanent. This is only in an emergency. So none of this applies we go back to the original um, open meeting law, which I would guess probably in January will be addressed because there will be things that we've learned from here that might be might make permanent changes to the open meeting law. But that isn't our goal here. So I, I'm, I don't know where we are here in terms of the bill itself, except for those three um, suggestions. Well, I, I, I found part of the uh, response in, in answer to your question. I'll just read this paragraph. Another thing, the boards were granted a big delay in posting minutes 
They now can take weeks to post minutes, which I must say have deteriorated in the last six months. And that's- well, what, that's what we did, he, he, Ross did suggest changing from 10 to five days. That was a very specific request. Yes. That- and, But I'm, you, you asked me about Wyndham County. That was a response from a Wyndham County reporter above and beyond the one with the school superintendent uh, issue. Uh, and there are probably some towns that are taking that long, but that was true when we didn't have this kind of, this was true before also, that there were um, people that didn't, there were people who shut down their websites when we said that they had to post them on their websites. So you're always gonna have those, those issues. I just don't know if they're more serious and more uh, prevalent now than they were before. I'm Tucker, I'm sorry. Just to note for the discussion around the 10 business day permission, uh, that is constrained to when there is a staffing shortage. And when that extension was discussed during the COVID response, the concept was if there is no staff to post minutes, then the public body should not be obligated to meet the default five day timeline. They can have an extra five days and it would be 10. But again, if you read that subdivision, it opens with the clause that says, in the event of a staffing shortage, the public body may have 10 days. And, and I guess we're one of the questions that I think got asked, I think in Lisa's letter, maybe not, but I'll ask it, is who determines the staffing shortage. I mean, you know, I I just had a public records request from I won't say which agency the other day, and somebody said, "Well, our guy is on vacation." Well, I'm not sure that there's an exemption to the public records law for that, and so any clerk can say, "Well, we're short staff," and who's to say whether they are? Or are? I, I just that that intro phrase was bothersome, I think, to Karen. Yeah, I think that um, a number of the issues that were raised in Lisa Loomis's letter are really best practices. And for instance, introducing who's at the meeting and um, asking people to announce themselves when they speak. And certainly those are things that can be covered in training. We do training on a regular basis for select boards and, and public bodies. I would also just um, mention that on page three in section E, it requires that um, you continue to post notices in or near the municipal clerk's office and shall provide a copy of each notice or agenda to the newspapers of general circulation for the municipality. And that's actually new. Um, in the emergency provisions that you put in place. So they should have copies of the um, agendas and notices of the meetings. And I can tell you they're not complying with that. But we can't, <laughs> we only write the rules. We can't, we don't, we can't go out there and beat them over the head and enforce the rules. If somebody, if they're not complying with it, then there has to be a complaint or a or something, but I don't know how else we, how we make it clear that it says they shall do it. Well, Who does it there's no us? fine in there. There's no fine or anything listed in that section. There's a, there's a um, uh, cure for open meeting in the open meeting law. There is a section that we put in about five years ago as of a cure for it. So if they, aren't doing what they're supposed to do and they make decisions at those meetings, there's a cure for that. It's called elections. And Ross- oh, No, there's an actual cure. Oh, really? Ross yeah. has a- We Ross put it in about five years ago. Am I right, Tucker? Yes. There's, Ross? Ross has a question. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Um, I'm not sure what the definition of um, staff is. I mean, so many towns in Vermont um, the select board are volunteers. The town clerk may be the only paid position in a town, um, but you know, I'm I'm just not sure if, if 
the staff isn't available, what, how that works broadly. I mean, my thought is take the minutes, publish them on the town website. And um, so they're there. And that doesn't necessarily require a staff. Again, um, at the library board here, the, the secretary of the board, who's a voluntary board member, sits there with their laptop, types the minutes, and then sends them. And um, I don't know whether she only sends them to the board of trustees or whether they're on the library website, but they could be with you know, uh, a keystroke. And uh, um, I don't know, but I'd be willing to guess that there are probably more um, municipal boards of all stripes uh, taking minutes with iPads or laptops than there are municipal employees, staff throughout the state. And so I just don't see the, the, the uh, hurdle to prevent um, publishing minutes in a very timely manner um, after whatever board meeting, commission meeting, whatever um, on the municipal level. Can I suggest that we have really three issues here? I mean, we have, there are a lot of issues around compliance and people doing it. And, and maybe there are issues that we need to take up in January, but we are not making any permanent changes to the open meeting law now. We're not doing that. Right. We don't have I'm time or the ability to do that. So we're only doing things in an emergency. So it looks to me like the three issues are posting the minutes within five days or 10 days or some other number of days, um, getting publishing the access um, in, the, in the agendas, how people access and publishing how they can participate <coughs> so that people know what they have to do to participate. Do they have to go someplace? Do they have to borrow their kid's laptop? What is it that they have to do in order to participate? Publishing that. It seems to me that those are the issues that we have right now. And I'd like to just focus on those so that we can um, come to some resolution. Does that make sense, committee? Yes. I see two thumbs up and I see three thumbs up. And that again. Two thumbs, one thumb up and one pen down. I'm not sure what that was all about, but okay. <laughs> so let's go to the meeting, the minutes first and um, have a discussion about that. Committee, where are you on that issue? I, I am happy with 10 actually, because I don't think everybody is as efficient as the two examples that have been shared with us. I also think people who, didn't have uh, uh, children at home, also, you know, now have kids at home working more than they have been. I think there are more distractions. I think there's, I, I don't know, I, I feel like there it's life is much more stressed and much more is on our plates, but you know, that's just me. So I would vote to keep the 10 days. I don't think it's, uh, I, I think the issues of the days has always been an issue. And five days, you know, we, got, we were asked a couple of years ago to move to calendar days rather than, I mean, to move to business days rather than calendar days. Um, you know, it's the, the days have been an issue from the beginning. Brian? Well, I'll be glad to take the opposite view. Um, I would favor going back to five. I think whatever situation we are in right now has become pretty normal for most people and I think five days is plenty of time to uh, be able to put minutes together. Chris? Uh, I, I too prefer the shorter time. And, and practically, I mean, I think two practical things. One is for others who are gonna rely on that to do the reporting, if you're out 10 days, and now the reporting takes some time then to distribute the information, you're, you're verging on two weeks behind. Um, and then, then practically having taken minutes many times, they're, I think you write better minutes when you write them closer to the time of the event 
Um, while you still remember things, right? you know, two weeks later, it can be pretty hard to remember uh, the details of what you recorded. Well, we 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 adjourn for um, a month, and we already forgot who we all are. So, your uh, point is well taken, Anthony. I I would go for five days. I think that five days. I mean, I don't, I don't honestly have a strong feeling about it, but I think that five days should be enough. I think that kind of balancing a little bit off what Senator Bray was just saying, but 10 days is a long time. You might forget to do it after 10 days. It seems like ancient history. So I think making it, well, doing it when it's more fresh in people's minds is better. And I think five days is doable, even during an emergency. Um, I, I'm okay. I'm actually okay with five days. I have um, sympathy for the people who are taking them. And in Karen's situation, I, I understand. And people who have kids at home who are trying to teach their kids and everything, I, I do understand that. Our town clerk, when we first um, uh, passed this, I mean, our town manager, when we first passed this, that said they had to be um, submitted electronically and people were just going crazy. She said she takes her little scribbled notes that she has and scans them in and post them that's her minutes i mean it right. doesn't say they have to be nicely typed up and submitted so i i'm i'm okay with um five days karen or gwen i'm sure you're not okay with that but would you like to comment no thank you Okay, um, I, I'm left hanging. I hear your uh, arguments. You're all make good points. Well, I I just wanted to I, I think just to chime in when we when, when you sorry when the legislature put this together, um, the stay at home order was in place, and we had a lot of towns that were furloughing um, staff, and we have a lot of towns that weren't allowing staff into their um, offices, where sometimes computer access to web postings was that was the only place I know that's true for my town. Um, so like the one or two people that may or may not have access to that, um, would, th that would be the reasoning that the 10 days made sense because it was just not chaos, but pretty darn close to it. So um, now that we're, you know, five, four or five months out, it's, it's, it, you're looking through it uh, with a different lens. Um, so um, it's, I, I think, I don't think we're going to fall on our sword over the 10 days, obviously, but in the, there was a really good reason for having that 10 days when we put the, when you put the 10 days in initially. Okay. All right. So settled five days. Sounds that way. Okay. So the other one is putting the, um, adding. No. So the, sorry, uh, Adam chair, it's five business days. No. Five calendar days. Red field argument. It's always been. Which is it? It was calendar days. Yeah, I hate that. Yeah. Okay. Great. There we are. Tucker, it does say cal calendar days. Okay. Um, so then the next question is do we add um, the, to the, uh, part that says the, for attendance, and do we add the word and participation, the ability to participate? I think that was Senator Colomore's suggestion. Where are we with that committee? Well, obviously I'm for it. I, I, I think it's important that people know that they have the right to participate and that they do have the right to participate I thought that early on when Tucker was talking to us about it, that it was sort of implied into current law. So it wouldn't necessarily need to be explicitly said in terms of what we're doing now. But I think that there has to be, we have to, we, we cannot, we, we have to expect and enable, empower people to participate at meetings. So I think if, it, if we have to say it, then I, I would be supportive of saying it. Okay, Chris? Uh, I agree. Thank you. I think, you know, it's a different time. So once upon a time, just showing up to a physical meeting, you knew if you're called on, you could participate. But if you're not, if you don't have the right kind of invitation to a, a meeting, then you can only observe it, you know, YouTube versus Zoom, that kind of thing. Allison? 
Uh, sorry, I had to take a family business call and I uh, missed the question. Just say yes. Yes. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Um, Madam so, Chair. <laughs> yes. Mike, I'm sorry, Allison. <laughs> was oh, I was calling on you because you weren't calling on yourself. <laughs> no, it, 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 it's access versus uh, right to uh, ability to participate. Right? There's a there. I, yeah. Brian suggested just putting and participate. How how that they yeah. Perfect. Yes. And then the third question is, I believe. <laughs> Does that information get put in the agenda automatically, and um, with the of how how they connect, whether it's the the Zoom address, the telephone call, the number, does it get put in there automatically, or do people have to call to get it? That I believe is the other question. Well, when you put out a notice to a meeting, you'd say the meeting's going to take place at town hall, let's say, or people know where town hall is. You don't say psych board's going to have a meeting, come and look for us, you know, <laughs> if you can find us, it's up to you. I mean, you know, normally know where the meeting's going to be. And if we're talking about electronic meetings, Zoom meetings, for example, I think people need to know where they are, which means that, what do we call it, the access code, I don't know what you call it, the link should be there so people can see it and know that's where the meeting's going to be. It'd be like saying it's going to be a town hall or you know, 14 Main Street. Instead mm -hmm. of being 14 Main Street, it's basically a Zoom link. So I think it should be on there, yes. Brian. So thank you, Manager. I'll just chime in on this because Senator Polina and I were in the committee, which to my knowledge is still the only time that's happened to the legislature. It happened very early on in this uh, situation in Senate agriculture when I don't know who it was. I think I know, but I, it doesn't matter. It was one of the other senators of the committee gave the Zoom link to someone else and they gave it to someone else who gave it to someone else. And all of a sudden, halfway through, we're just besieged with this pornographic thing that was happening and the guy yelling and screaming. So we had to close the meeting because at that time we had no knowledge of how to do this. So that said, it's only happened one time. Uh, to my knowledge, in the legislature. But we are very careful about whom we send the address to. That said, I know the administration branch uses a different platform, something called Teams, which has a little bit more uh, security built into it, I guess, and is harder to hack into. Um, to Mike Donahue's point, and I think Chris mentioned it too, Senator Bray, um, there are ways to stop it if someone does Zoom bomb you without closing the whole meeting off from what I understand. So I guess I'm in favor of posting um, the link right along with the agenda. Thank you. Yeah. Allison? Oh yeah, I mean, we, we've been doing it here in Woodstock and it's worked well. So yes, I, I agree with Brian. Karen? And uh, Anthony? I would ask that you um, leave some flexibility to municipalities in this regard. I mean, yes, post the electronic location of the meeting, but if they find if if a municipality is using Zoom and they want to have you ask them for the code to get into that meeting, which is the same thing we do in your committee meetings, that that would be permissible. Um, it, there are as I mentioned before, other platforms out there that, that towns use, I think you don't want to get into the business of designating platforms, but um, I would ask that you also leave some flexibility in this regard. Mike? Madam Chair, uh, I guess we would disagree with that. Uh, I think the issue, I think in Lisa's letter, spelled it out pretty clearly that the people have to call in or or get permission to participate in a meeting and if you don't call in by 4 or four thirty when town hall closes and they have a meeting that night at 7 or seven thirty, then you're out of luck and i think anybody can walk into at the last minute to uh, town hall to go to a meeting and if you've got to give three or four or five hours notice and get permission to get the codes that is not transparency. Russ? I 
agree with that. And I think Senator Polina really um, stated it very clearly that um, we're going to have a meeting tonight at seven. Come find us. You know, where do I look? And uh, um, if you don't have the, the link, the access code, and the meeting um, is an electronic meeting because of an emergency, how do you find it? And um, if you come in, you've been out of town, you come back to town, you hear there's a meeting tonight, how do you find that meeting if you can't find mm -hmm. the link? And as Mike just said, the, the office is closed. Oh, sorry. The agenda is a, is a way that you go and look and find it. Chris? Huh. Well, I, I don't I don't know what the answer is. I, I'm trying to think of something that provides that kind of general access because I for all the good reasons we just heard from um, people on the call. And uh, at the same time, I'd like to make sure we don't um, inhibit the town's ability to maintain a secure meeting, just like Ledge IT is very security conscious on our behalf. And we figured it out, we figured something out. So I, I'm just, I don't know, I, I would wanna read and think a little bit, is there a way to both guarantee that access, but make sure that we don't do anything that fouls up um, a town from saying, okay, now that we've been Zoom bombed twice. We're going to do something a little differently, and and then we put them at odds with the law. We, I don't. I am sure none of us want to do that. I just don't know how to craft something that uh, achieves that yet. Allison, so um, I I think that Karen's suggestion about uh, the LCT doing some further training, uh, maybe next time they start they do their trainings. Uh, it would be great to be able to train in both in, in the two platforms that are used mostly team, Google Teams and Zoom. Uh, it would be great to train for control because, you know, I, I, it, publishing it in the agenda is an easy, simple way to do it. It gives you the electronic uh, access and the telephone access. Uh, it's so straightforward, uh, but you also need to be able to control the meeting. And so I think further training is, is what's called for here for the towns and, um, but I, I, I think it's working well in the towns that include it in on the agendas. I, I think that um, I, I think we need to um, allow the select boards to have some security and I, I yeah. but I think that if, if we've really only had two or three incidents since March in, at select board meetings at, and, and planning commissions. And it isn't just 246 meetings because there's 246 towns and they each probably have five or six meetings a month. I mean, it's, it's well, a lot of meetings. And, and, it's, and it's all the other meetings. It's, I'm a chair that's of, the, what I, of the that's what I just That's what yeah. I just said. Yeah, oh, okay. That, that they have a lot of other meetings other than select boards. And so if we haven't, if our experience has been horrible as it was in Brattleboro, um, that they really don't have that much of an issue. The, uh, it seems to me that the balance then goes to allowing the participation and shutting down if you really have to and doing it again. I, I don't know how, and Chris set, seems to think there are ways of, of shutting down, of doing it now without Doing it. And and I and I have to say we have um, our the technology is so is advancing so fast that and our tech people are so great. We had a conference the a first conference committee on Zoom, and we were in the conference committee, which was public, and anybody could watch and listen and um, be there. When we went into and the comparable thing here would be going into an executive session. If you needed to go into an executive session, we just were moved into this separate room. So the Senate conferees went into this room over here and the House conferees went into this room over here and it was just us. It wasn't, and the whole, the rest, the public part of the meeting was just put on hold. 
and it was just there. So it was very easy for us to just slide right into what really was an executive session. Um, and I think the same thing could be true. It's gonna take training and it's gonna be really hard for towns where you have three volunteer select people that uh, meet once every two weeks. Um, it's gonna be difficult, but I think that I'm, I'm fine with publishing it and I don't know how you um, allow that flexibility um, for towns without saying they don't have to publish it. I, Chris? Um, I'm just wondering if, if we're not done, I don't know if we're gonna talk about this after today or are we wrapping up this today? Yeah. Me, my, hope, my hope is that we, if we can come up with some language for tomorrow that everyone can agree on, because yeah. I, my hope is that we can pass this out tomorrow. Because if we don't, it's not going to have time to get through to the house anyway. Sure. Okay. Well, since we are going to come back to it, um, one thought might be to have Kevin Moore from Ledge IT talk to us, and just he seems to be very, very knowledgeable about uh, all this electronic meeting format stuff, and he might just be able to answer some of our questions. Yeah, I just need to know how, what language we put in here. I don't need to know how to do it. I just need no, to I know just, what language we put in here right. that well, allows some flexibility, but my guess is Tucker, to publish it. Tucker, if we give that task to Tucker, my guess is he can rise to the occasion. <laughs> Tucker, could you maybe um, have some a conversation maybe with Karen and Ross or Mike and Gwen and see if you if we can figure out some compromise way of doing this. Is that possible? I, I know it's a very short notice, but. I will certainly do so. We may run into issues of interpretation. I'll read to you the language, the way it stands right now and the way that okay. it was included in the COVID response. The public body is required to post information on how the public may access meetings electronically and include the information in the published agenda for each meeting. Oh. So there the requirement is that the information has to include how the public may access the meetings electronically and that it has to be in each agenda. I haven't done a comprehensive look at how every municipality in the state is doing this right now, but I know that the town that I live in posts information on you know, how I can access it through Zoom and by telephone in each yep. agenda for their meetings. Um, we so can maybe say that. more narrowly tailor this or constrain it to make sure that there's no room for interpretation. Um, and for that, I assume that Karen, Gwyn, Ross, and Mike might have some suggestions from their practical experience on how we can really make it clear that there has to be information on accessing the meeting in the agenda. Because it does sound like an interpretation could be that um, the information on how you access is that you call the town hall to get the to get the access information. So Mike to attend a public meeting, call us and we'll let you know. <clears throat> and some people get a call back, some people don't mm -hmm. right away. So I wonder if in what Tucker just read, uh, whether you add the words including access codes or something like that. Well, that's what, if we can get that worked out so that everybody is okay with it um, tomorrow, can we, is it possible to, uh, and nobody will um, be 100% agreeable to it, I'm pretty sure, but if we can just, work on it look we have five brilliant minds here okay Gwen, tucker i think you're talking about the senator okay. she's not mike she's not including us yeah no not us i mean i thought that's who she was referring to are you kidding <laughs> you get the final word though <laughs> no 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 i meant the five brilliant minds that are going to work this out Plus, it then goes to the House. If you come up with a brilliant solution between the Senate and the House, you could write. Right. <laughs> that is true. Yeah. Yes. Let's hear it for the House, Chris. <laughs>
Okay, Tucker. I think you had raised that last piece as the last issue that the committee had to discuss, but there was actually one more suggestion that you had brought up during the course of the meeting, and that was whether to add the term publicly accessible before oh. designated electronic location. I thought we already agreed on that one. I, I Everybody thought shook their heads. Yeah. Got it. Thank okay. You. you have you have to. It, it's harder to read body language on Zoom, but I've learned to pick up body language from the committee members pretty well here, um, and I think everybody agreed on that one. Yeah, we did. Okay. All right. So I I think that I think we have a pretty decent bill here. I I do too. I'm I'm really delighted that we're be the first in the state house, as it were, to do a lessons learned bill. I think this is great. Thank you, Madam Chair, for taking the lead. So I want to point out something here. You know when we're going through a bill and you go do section six and then A and then who and then um, little I little two little eyes. Tucker used the um, term Romanette, and I yeah. just, I love that term. I've never known what to call those little things, and they're Romanettes. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Just like goddesses. Goddesses are Romanettes, too. <laughs> I'm a genet. <laughs> Madam Chair. Yes. One, one question. Ross did, did bring up a question. I think it was Ross. The, the issue of staffing, that phrase, uh, shortage of staffing. Well, we I mean, changed it to five days. Right. So Don't bring us down, Mike. So that whole that whole phrase is struck then. It we changed it to five days. Okay. But I'm. I just want to know. I got if, out and if, I I just want to know if the that phrase in the event of shortage of staff, that phrase is totally struck. Because it's and irrelevant. Then the five, and then the five is made to 10. Yeah. I mean, the 10 is made to five. Okay. 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 Tucker? Okay. Just as a drafting note, that entire subdivision will just be taken out because we want it to default back to the general law, oh. which requires posting in five days. So there's no need to call out the staffing shortage and there's no need to enumerate the five days because that's the standard. Good call. Good, yeah. Anything else? No. <laughs> I, I'm gonna thank the league for sending out a a blast to their members on the other particular issue I'm working on right now. So. Oh, you. you're kidding. That means we'll all suffer. No. <laughs> Hopefully. No. Oh, well, yes. I hope you get calls from all of your, every single town. Yes, it, it, it requires a proactive. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm on to you. Okay. Is it is it fair to ask what the topic is, generally? Take, take a guess. Sure. See how clever. You are. I'm on a conference committee. Yeah. What conference committee is she on? <laughs> Marijuana. S fifty four. S fifty four. Okay. Okay. Anything uh, else, committee members, or anybody you're, else? You're Chris, there's already I sent a text, Chris. Wait. Chris, Chris is trying to say something, I think. Um, your wish has already come true, Chair White. While we've been meeting, uh, emails have started to show up from Addison County towns. So. Yeah. <laughs> well, I encourage I'm them to my their, their <laughs> counterparts on the other side of the, because that's where the holdup is. Well, I always like hearing from folks, so. I know, okay. Anything else, Betsy Ann? Are we all set? Okay, and Tucker, we're all set. And 
Lauren and David have been, um, their names are still there. I'm sure they've paid attention to every word we've been saying, but um, so thank you. Um, so I guess we'll see you tomorrow at one. And I look forward. And I believe that um, they're doing- We have set, Senate floor at one. Well, then after Senate floor. I believe, Betsy Ann, that they're doing 220 on the floor tomorrow. I think and so. But listening in, and um, it hasn't come up yet. It's on notice calendar today, and they didn't do uh, do it in all House caucus. So I think they'll just do it second reading tomorrow. Okay, good. So, so I, that's, yeah. Um, I just want to keep us aware of the bills that, um, and so tomorrow, um, we should have a little bit of time to walk through their final drafts and we make sure that we're okay. But I don't think there are any surprises since last time you walked us through it. Okay. So in 124, do we have any update on 124? Uh, House GovOps is continuing to take testimony on it. And I expect that I'll at least go through next week. I'm not sure how long they'll be discussing it, but it's it's definitely not going to be done by the end of this week. Okay. All right. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. You have, rough, you have a rough time for these meeting tomorrow. What? You have My, a rough time when the committee is meeting tomorrow. Um well we're on the floor at one. I mean at eleven thirty. No, what just no, tomorrow? No, we're on the floor at one and we have migratory bird. We have migratory birds and maybe one or two other things. It's not going to be long, is my guess. I would say a quarter to two at the latest. Okay. Is that right, Chris? We have migratory birds. He's yes. flapping his wings, but you can't hear him. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. Anyway, Isabel. <laughs> All right. Say hi. Okay, hi Isabel. <laughs> oh, is Isabel there? Hi Isabel. Isabel. Oh. Isabel's so excited because she gets to go for a walk now. I know. And eating. And eating. <laughs> Goodbye, everybody. All right. Goodbye, four corners of the state. Chris, yeah. we have a Bye. chair meeting.